All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're back for our next video that little delay, but as I said, things get busy. So, anyway, today we're going to go ahead and cover the secession crisis of 1861, which was really the progenitor for the Civil War. It was really the powder keg, so to speak, to start it. And this is initially what the Civil War was somewhat about, but the this is part of a going to kind of be a duology, not really, but it's like a duology video where our next video we're talking about the Lost Cause. So in this video, what we're talking about is the history of the Session Crisis. Basically, we want to look at what caused the Southern states that were slaveholders to rebel and decide that they wanted to break away from the United States and try to form their own nation, the Confederate States of, the, of America. What led them to that point? Now, we're not going to go much farther than probably February of 1861, so I do apologize. We'll mention briefly, of course, as we all know, it was like after Fort Sumter that the war really began, but this is like in the lead up. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and hit this topic today, and I'm hitting these two videos mostly because, A, it's 160 years since the start of the Civil War this year. It started 160 years ago in 1861. And on top of that, there's also this continued lie that the Civil War was not about slavery. I hate to tell you, Southerners, it was. Now, I accept that there, most people have probably accepted that, but there's a, still a lot of deniers out there who would like to have you think co contrary to common belief and contrary to the truth that slavery was not the main cause of the Civil War. If you do not honestly believe that slavery was the honest cause of the Civil War, I don't know what kind of mind you have that would persuade you to think that way. I can only say you're sick, and you are terribly wrong. The Civil War, I, I mean, you can argue many ways. You can argue it was about states' rights. You could argue it was about an economic war. You could argue many things. You could argue it was an escape from governmental tyranny. but And we could go down any of those routes. But when you ultimately will come up with one way or another, no matter what the question is, no matter what the statement, at one point or another, there will be a certain word that comes up. And that word is slavery. And really, if slavery is coming up in almost any question of a possible cause of the Civil War, that kind of points to one thing. It was about slavery because in every excuse you'll make, you do end up having to mention slavery at some point. That's a central theme here. So what does that tell you? And if you really look at the events of the secession crisis, every single state that seceded from the Union in its ordinances of secession, every single one of them referenced or directly stated the institution of slavery as a main cause. Every single one of them in their Confederate Constitution, explicitly plain in text, has a clause in it that directly protects slavery, Insti protects the institution from ever being abolished in the Confederate States. So don't tell me it wasn't about slavery, because if it wasn't, why were they going to such amends to, A, mention it, and why were they going to such degree as to enshrine it in their Constitution as a right? Oh, but it's not about slavery. Then what the hell other reason would they have had for it? Tell me that with an honest, straight face. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and start here. And the secession crisis is based around the concept of secession, of course. And secession is this concept that a state of the Union, or the United States, but we're going to refer to it as the Union, any state at any point, just like states could enter and ask to be admitted into the Union, they could also ask, they could not ask, but they could choose on their own behalf that they could break away and withdraw from it, basically leave. They could enter and they could leave it at their choosing. Of course, the Constitution does not have any explicit law or clause in it that exactly mentions anything about secession, but there's nothing that really says it's legal either. And this has been the constant argument in American politics ever really since the Constitution was written is we don't – the question being was secession Ill, really illegal or was it true? 
And, and to all you deniers out there, you might take that chance right there and you're like, well, if secession was possibly legal, why is it a big deal? Well, I'm not saying that we're arguing over whether or not the southern states legally could secede. I think what we're arguing here is the reason that they did was not exactly a good moral reason. In fact, it was probably the one of the most evil reasons you could to defend an institution that was literally the enslavement literally the beating the horrible conditions that came with it the beating of human beings and use of them like property for economic benefit the use of human beings for economic benefit let's put it that way that's sick anyway secession as a concept at least in american politics dates back to roughly right with the American Revolution in about 1776, when South Carolina, which ironically, South Carolina just seems to love secession because it's threatened it more than any other state in history. South Carolina was the very first to really bring up the concept when in 1776, it threatened to break with the Continental Congress. South Carolina had already declared that it was breaking away and going to fight against Great Britain. It was already fighting for independence along with the other colonies. And up until 1776, it was allied with the Continental Congress. It was in this sort of loose alliance with the other colonies. However, in 1776, South Carolina threatened to break with the Continental Congress and separate itself from them when the Continental Congress proposed a population tax to be imposed on all states that would include slaves in the population count. So if a state has slaves, the slaves would be counted as a whole person. Each slave would be counted as a person. Well, South Carolina is like, uh, that. no, they're not people. You shouldn't count them. And what kills me, and this also shows you how deeply corrupt the Southern politicians were at that time, at least the uh, ones that supported slavery, is we mentioned here that South Carolina was threatening to break away because the Continental Congress wanted to introduce a tax on states based upon population. Thus, if you had a higher population count, you were probably going to have a higher tax. Then less, lower taxes. So let's think about that. Now let's think about something I also mentioned, if you recall, during our Constitutional Convention video back in September, where we mentioned that in the Constitution, when they were trying to determine the population count for the House of Representatives, they were trying to determine, they knew it was going to be on population, that the each state's representatives would be, ter be, ter would be determined by that state's population overall, would determine how many representatives they got. Now, the southern states, when that happened, argued that they did want the slaves to count as a person. Why? Because if they counted the slaves as a whole per as they counted each slave as a person, the southern states that were slaveholding would have far more representation in Congress than any northern state in the House. Thus, they would have more political power. But earlier on, roughly 10 or 12 years before, in 1776, one of those southern states when it came to the issue of counting slaves in a population, except this time, it, instead of representation in Congress, it was for a tax. Oh no, they were against it. They were against it when it would hurt them, but they were for it when it would help them. They were against counting slaves when counting them as part of the population would increase the tax that they got on their own citizens, but they were for counting slaves as a person when it would benefit their own political advantage in Congress, meaning they would have more power. Do you, see, do you see how this kind of rolls? It's good if it serves us. It's bad if it don't. If it harms the white plantation owners, no, no, we, no. We're not, we're not counting slaves. They're not people. They're property. But the moment they get the chance to maybe up their own political power, oh yeah, let's count them as people. You see how corrupt these people are? They were for it then. Well, they were for it later. But they weren't for it when it came to taxes. This shows you how corrupt slavery really was. They would they used slavery as a tool when they could. Now, secession was a major concept of Enlightenment thinkers that stemmed from the Enlightenment period, mainly in the writings of John Locke and Jean Jacques Rousseau, who we talked about about a week or two ago. And they had of course, as just a kind of a refresher, they proposed that if there was a despotic, despot, despotic government or whatever you call it, a tyrannical government, a government that wasn't obeying the people's will, 
the people had a right to revolution. Secession was derived basically from that concept that what, what what if we're basically what if we're admitted into this union and then the government stops serving our interests? Don't we have a right to leave and rebel against that government if that's the case? Now, James Madison, our fourth president and our one of our Secretary of State, early founding father and father of the Constitution, he was a very early opponent of secession. And he was from Virginia. He was from a slave owning state and he owned slaves himself. And he was an early opponent of secession. He warned that disunion would destroy the nation. He didn't think secession was very good at all because he did not see each individual state being able to survive on its own. He said that we need the nation united as a whole. No state can survive on its own as a separate entity. It wouldn't be possible in today's world or in that world back then. Now, Madison had even argued during the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Madison had argued that they should include a clause in the Constitution that explicitly forbade well, forbid secession. Of course, it never happened, but Madison did make the suggestion. He viewed it as a def definitely concerning problem. Now, Madison, ironically, would later kind of add fuel for secession, or at least not fuel, but what would be the word, credibility to the idea. Ironically, although he was officially against it, him and Thomas Jefferson in the 1790s introduced the Kentucky and Virginia legislature resolutions in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts passed in about 1798 by the Adams administration, John Adams. And in these, this was, of course, sponsored in each of the respective states. Thomas Jefferson sponsored the Kentucky Resolution and James Madison sponsored the Virginia Resolution. And what these basically did was it declared that these two states could cancel that those law, that the Alien Sedition laws that basically limited the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, they were bad laws. I mean, I can't exactly blame him for introducing this, but it also gives terms to credibility in a way because it proposed the idea that if there's a law that is passed by the government that a state does not like, thinks works against that state's interest, then the state can choose to simply nullify or cancel that law within its borders. It doesn't have to obey that law. It can choose what laws it can and will not follow. Now, this is not explicit secession. But this adds power basis to it because people think become thinking that this is legal, so why can we not leave? If we can already cancel laws that we don't want to do, which really you can't, it was an idea that ironically Jefferson and Madison proposed simply working against the Federalist base at that time, which I'm not going to say in that case it wasn't needed. But it ultimately added fuel for secessionist thought, thinking that if we can cancel a law, why can't we leave if it becomes that bad? Now, while neither argued for that official sovereignty for individual states, they argued that they could enumerate laws. They basically could cancel them out. And the first real – any problem of a possible secession crisis came during the War of 1812 and about 1814. Remember, the, year, the war lasts about two years. And this was when a collection of delegates from Federalist New England, the New England area during the War of 1812 was basically the only area left that the Federalist Party at the time still had a lot of political power. The rest of the country was being run by the Democratic Republicans. And the Federalists in New England, such as Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, they were in Rhode Island. These states met at what they called the Hartford Convention in Hartford, Connecticut, and they were considering the no notion of secession from the United States. And basically, they were wanting to think, they were pondering whether or not New England, the New England state, should secede from the United States. Now, why would they think this? Well, the Federalists at this time, it wasn't, it was partly for their own political usage, but at the other end, the Federalists were very much against the War of 1812. The New England area was very much against it as a whole. They actually refused to take part in the invasion of Canada during the war. And they honestly, although they were against the war, they ended up being some of the hardest hit people in the country because of the war because of Britain's naval blockade of the United States coast, which, of course, New England is very largely dependent on overseas trade to make its money. And its economy was very much over based on sea trade. Well, the British are blockading the coast. They're, the New England merchants aren't being able to make their money. The New England economy is struggling. And the Federalists in New England, who are already against the war, they're, they're saying, well, this 
tyrannical government has launched a war that is not even in our interests, that's hurting us. It's The government's not serving our will and our wishes anymore, so why don't we break away? Now, eventually, the war did end before they really got serious into the question. It was ended in December of 1814, and of course, the Hartford Convention kind of dissolved, and the Federalists eventually, it kind of caused the Federalist Party's extinction because people heard about the Hartford Convention, and e just the notion that they had even considered trying to separate a section of the nation from the rest of it made a lot of people think of the Federalist Party as traitors, and that, that rapidly kind of killed them off, and within, a, within about five years, the Federalist Party was actually extinct. Because people had lost their trust, they started viewing them as traitors and everything else because they had proposed breaking the Union up. But after the death of the Federalist Party in 1820, it basically becomes the North versus the South. Now, this was two regions of the United States that begin to emerge. You have the North, which is largely free. Most of the states in the North actually, and any that did have slavery like the original 13 colonies, eventually by the early 1800s, most of them have abolished slavery. They no longer have it within their borders. And most of the new states being created in the former Northwest Territory, such as Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, they have had Northwest the Northwest Ter Ordinance ban slavery in the Northwest Territory. So these states were automatically created with slavery banned within their borders. They were free states. In the South, you had what was called, became to be referred to as slave states, states where slavery was legal. You could own a slave. And this largely propagated in a line south of the southern border of Missouri because of the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Now, give or take, there were a few that were, had been created prior to that line that that didn't apply, such as Kentucky and parts of Virginia. Of course, Maryland and Delaware still had slavery. But the only new state above that line, the only two new states above that line that had slavery above the southern border of Missouri was, of course, Missouri itself and the state of Kentucky. Now, after the Compromise of 1820, any new slave states that were to be created could only be created out of territory that was south of that line. So that meant, like, Arkansas could become a slave state. Uh, what is now Oklahoma could become a st slave state. New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. Louisiana. Of course, Louisiana was basically or created at that time. Now, what becomes the major problem between the North and the South is their difference on economies. The North becomes very much a partaker in the Industrial Revolution, revolution that is going on across the globe. It starts in it starts in industrializing very rapidly. Factories grow up in the North. There's no slave labor, so there's really no agriculture that is of a large scale, and then agriculture kind of dies down in many places in the north in, in place of factories, such as textile mills and other stuff like that. So the north is becoming a rapid industrial complex. It's factor, It has factories going up. It's industrializing. Railroads are being built. The south kind of lags behind the north. The south never really gets an industrial revolution of its own. It doesn't build the massive factory that you see in the north. The south remains very much agrarian society. It remains very much farms, plantations. It's very rural. It isn't the big industrial powerhouse that the north is becoming. And it wants to stay this way. So from 1819 through 1860, the, big, the widening divide between these two regions of the country, one that is becoming rapidly industrial, industri industrialized and the other that's increasingly staying agrarian, contrary to the, what the rest of the country is doing, kind of starts not only causing this physical, not only this uh, technological and industrial divide, but it's also causing a political divide between the two regions because, of course, due to their different kinds of economies, they have conflicting interests in, con in Congress. And, of course, there's also the moral obligation of slavery. Is it right or wrong? Many in the North, where slavery was abolished, came to view that slavery was very much wrong, it was evil, and needed to be ended. The South, who depends upon slave labor for its economy, as a, as a massive work free workforce in order to harvest its crops and get everything done, very much see slavery as integral and essential for its economy to thrive. 
and this sets the two regions at odds. Now, during the 1819 through 1860 time era, one of the most profound supporters of Southern rights, of Southern secession, was none other than South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun. Now, Calhoun was a major proponent of states' rights and the South's way of life, especially in regards to slavery. He was very much a supporter of the slavery institution. Now, Calhoun commonly argued that a state could nullify or cancel any federal law that acted against its own interests, which had been, which Southerners argued had been justified through the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of the late 1790s. Of course, Calhoun used this as well in his speeches and referenced this. And he, in 1835 or 1830, what was it? It was during the 1830s. I, I made a video on it about a year ago. I sometimes forget the year. I know it was during Andrew Jackson's presidency in the 1830s. I'll probably have that video shared up at the end of this one. That way you can go back and watch it if you need to or watch it for the first time if you've not seen it at all. So he actually proposed there was a new tariff that was passed during the Andrew Jackson administration. And Calhoun, who was the vice president of the United States at that time, he protested the tariff because it would hurt a lot of the southern economy more than it would the North due to the import tax that it put on. And the South was much more reliant upon imports than the North was. So Calhoun was very much against this. And he argued that South Carolina could nullify that law. It would not apply to South Carolina. Well, Jackson was very much irate about this. He argued against it, and Calhoun eventually resigned the vice presidency due to his differences with Jackson. And after resigning, him and South Carolina threatened that if the tariff was not removed, South Carolina would secede from the Union. They would break away. Jackson was furious. And unlike later presidents who kind of took a blind eye to the South's threats and really didn't do anything to try to prevent it, Jackson put his foot down and said that he would personally hang the governor of South Carolina if it seceded. South, so basically you have the two in a death match. South Carolina blinks first. As soon as Jackson issues that he will use force if South Carolina breaks away, South Carolina backs down like a whiny little puppy. They're like, oh, I did bad. I tick the man off. So they back off. And that saves the country from a secession crisis in the 1830s. But the idea was still mentioned. And it's still propagated after the fact. Now, Calhoun initially favored only nullification. He argued that there was no basis for a state to withdraw from the Union. He argued that nullification was the only legal way they could really combat this. That nullification, they could cancel these laws, and that's really their only choice. However, he eventually invoked that, came to invoke an idea that secession was legal after the territorial acquisitions made by the country after the Mexican cession in 1848, following the end of the Mexican American War, in which the United States gained most of the West, such as California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Colorado uh, Nevada, Utah. They gained most of that and most of the rest of Texas. And these were areas that slavery should be able to expand to. Most of those areas had some land that was below that dividing line set by the Missouri Compromise. However, the North was very much against the extension. By this point, the abolitionist movement in the North had grown so strong that they didn't care that there was this tradition of a dividing line. They argued that slavery was wrong and shouldn't be allowed to expand anywhere, no matter what condition. This I irritates and enrages the South. He argues that the North is going back on their word and argues that the North is trying to kill them and suffocate their economy by limiting the expansion of slavery into West ter Western territories. Now, many nationalists came to oppose Calhoun, and some of these included famous politicians such as John Marshall and Daniel Webster. Now, the Constitution, in the nationalist view, they argued that the Constitution operated through the states on the people directly and did not treat the states as an individual corporate body. Thus, secession had no legal basis because the states were acting as a corporate body. Well, they weren't treated that way by the Constitution, so they had no legal basis to, to issue something 
while acting as something that they weren't really weren't re weren't really at all. They were not a corporate body, thus they could not act as a corporate body. Now, this mostly won over in the North, and until his death, Calhoun played a particularly strong part in creating an idea of Southern unity, especially on the issue of slavery, that slavery was essential to the South's economy, that King Cotton, as they called it, was the main crop in the South, that it should be protected at all costs, and he even proposed the idea that slavery was not just critical to the South's economy, but that it was actually good for the black man. Yes, they argued that slavery was the natural place for African Americans, that slavery was actually okay for them because it actually gave them certain protections, like slave masters usually had to give them housing, they gave them food, and everything else. Not mentioning they beat the slaves, they would tear them apart from their families, if they had to, they would kill them. And you could kill a slave and not be punished for it unless you were killing a large plantation to own a slave. And then the only thing you might get punished for is you might get a fine. Yeah, no jail time. But basically, you could do whatever the heck you wanted with a slave. But, oh, th yeah, this is better. No, it's not. You're trying to invent a lie to protect your own wrongdoings. H how sick are you to be blind to how wrong slavery was? So you have a growing distrust between the North and South, where the North is becoming increasingly abolitionist. They don't want the expansion of slavery in any further territories, and they're also wishing for the ab abolition of it in the entire country. Of course, this runs detrimental to the South, who wants the expansion of slavery into the new territories, and deems that slavery is essential for its economy and is very much a racist society. They don't believe that blacks are equal to whites and should not have the rights that, black that whites do. Now, in the 1850s, the slavery issue once again comes and gets lit on fire when it comes to the forefront when Congress passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, which basically obliterates the Missouri Compromise and issues that the states of Kansas and Nebraska, even though they were north of that line, and if you follow the Missouri Compromise, they should have been a guaranteed free state, instead allows these states to choose whether or not they will allow slavery in their borders through pop popular sovereignty, basically people voting. If, a majority, if, they, if a majority of the population wants slavery, they can have it. If a majority of them do not want slavery, the state will be free. This causes hundreds and thousands of anti-slavery settlers and pro-slavery settlers, especially in Kansas, to move into these new territories that are on the verge of becoming states and try to swarm them with the population that would tip the balance of power in either in favor of a pro-slavery opinion or an anti-slavery opinion. That way the state would go either way. And this eventually comes to such a head that these groups start literally fighting each other. The towns are burned, gunshots, there's gun skirmishes everywhere, building... It's just chaos. There's massacres. It's known as Bleeding Kansas. And the government sits there and does nothing, basically because it allowed this to happen. And on the second, it's just as divided as the state is. Now, eventually, Kansas was admitted in 1861 as a free state. But it was like, by that time, the South was already seceding. By the time, it was right in the middle of the South seceding. So Kansas was no longer the big issue. Now, during the anti-slavery movement in the North, this gave rise to a new political party, the Republican Party. Yes, the GOP of today, which nowadays I must say with contempt, it's really derived a lot far from the greatness it once was. It really has. I will, I will say that. I'm honestly ashamed of the Republican Party. I really am. But anyway, back then they were a good organization. It's hard to believe. And... The Republicans were formed originally as an anti-slavery party in Wisconsin in 1856, and they had their first presidential candidate that year in the form of John C. Fremont, one of the famous westward explorers. Now, he did not win the nomination, though, because the Democrats were still united and had a base in the South. They were, had northern voters and southern voters where the Republicans were very much only in the North because they're anti-slavery. You really think hardly anyone's in the South going to vote for them? Well, the Democrats basically weren't willing to maintain the system as it was, and their candidate, James Buchanan, won the election in 1856. So, 
most Southerners start viewing the Republicans as an extremist party, and they start issuing that if a Republican administration is ever elected, they are a direct threat to the South's economy, to the South's institutions, and to the Southern way of life. And they start issuing that in the 1860 presidential election that's coming up in four years, if a Republican wins that election, they will secede from the Union. Of course, people, are, by this point, they're used to the South saying we're going to secede because there's been very few times the South actually acted out upon it or even got close. And the South's never really done it. They threatened it, but they never actually acted out on it. And many of the Northerners just kind of turn a blind eye and they say, nah, you're not really going to do it. <laughs> We've called your bluff before. Well, 1860 comes around and the slavery issue has become so contentious that by this point in time, the Democratic Party becomes split between a pro-slavery Southern Democrats and the anti-slavery Northern Democrats. And they, the Democratic Party actually ends up having two candidates in the election, one nominated by the Northern ones and one nominated by the Southerns. The Northern Democrats nominated Stephen Douglas, a rival of Abraham Lincoln. And he had done well in some of the congressional debates just a couple years prior during the Illinois senatorial elections. So they nominate him. And the Southern Democrats nominate John C. Breckinridge, Buchanan's vice president, who's a very much pro-Southern man. A third party also comes in the field as the Constitutional Union Party, who nominates candidate John Bell. The Constitutional Union was basically just for the continued existence of the current system, really, without doing much to modify it. Now, the Republicans nominate their second presidential candidate, and they nominate none other than Abraham Lincoln or Honest Abe, as we all know him now, who was fiercely opposed to the expansion of slavery into the new Western territories. And this is another lie that many people will believe. They really will. And especially in the South, if you're a pro-Confederate, if you do recognize the slavery issue, well, you'll say, well, Lincoln threatened he was going to get rid of it from the start. No, he did not. Lincoln only said during his presidential campaign in 1860, Lincoln had only stated that he was opposed to the expansion of slavery into new territories. He was willing to allow it to continue to exist where it already existed, but he would prevent it from going into new territories. Lincoln never at any time prior to his election said that he would abolish slavery in the entire country. He only stated he was opposed to its expansion, but that he would allow it to continue where it already was. Republicans said this. Confederates didn't give a hooting rat. Rats, damn. They really didn't. Because they all they heard was slavery is going to be prevented. And they took it as not just in the territories, but they took it that it was going to be prevented everywhere. Abolished. And you people that are still basically Confederates today in your ideology... That is one of the biggest lies you can tell yourself and your neighbors is that, oh, well, we were justified. He was going to do it from the start. No, you weren't. And no, he wasn't. There's hundreds of documents that show otherwise. And where do I see any document that states that he was going to abolish it prior? None. You want to know what caused the abolition of slavery? The South. I guarantee you this. If there had been no civil war, Lincoln probably wouldn't have abolished slavery throughout the entire country. But he came to see it as a necessity because of how ardent and just outright, what would be the word? Oh, I'm trying to think of the word here. It's on the tip of my tongue. Desperate, you Southerners were. If, had, if you hadn't fought a war, he probably wouldn't have abolished you. Ever think about that? It was a punishment to you. Now, Lincoln ultimately won the 1860 election with only 38% of the vote, but because there was four different candidates and the Democratic vote was split, and then the third parties never really do well anyway, that was enough to win. 
And this was despite the fact that Lincoln had not even appeared as a option on the ballots in nine of the southern states in the Deep South. He wasn't even on the ballot because they were so opposed to him because he was an anti-slavery expansionist candidate. To Southerners, Lincoln's victory and that of the Republican Party meant the end of slavery and that their institutions were going to come to a quick and crashing halt. And they, for the first time, carried out their threat. And on December 20th of 1860, just about a couple, a month and a couple weeks after the election, South Carolina, the state of South Carolina, officially issued an ordinance of secession and decided they were going to secede from the Union. Over the following seven weeks, through, through the first month of 1861, through January, in the first week of February, seven, well, not seven, I got to think here, the ugh, six more states would secede over the following seven weeks. The states of Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas would all secede following South Carolina's lead after Lincoln's election in November of 1860. And by f the first week of February of 1861, there are now southern seven southern states in the Deep South that have seceded away, basically the entire Deep South. And they not only choose that they're no longer a part of the United States, the issue ordinances of secession, they start drafting new constitutions for their states. And on top of that, they start sending their state militias to seize any federal forts and arsenals and any other federal federal property that's still within their borders. Such as the case was the progenitor of Fort Sumter in South Charleston, South Carolina, or in Florida, you had Fort Pickens. Outgoing President James Buchanan did not believe, he basically just sat there. He did nothing. He sat there and claimed that he did not believe that secession was right, that the southern states had no right to leave the Union, but he claimed that he had no authority to stop them. Yeah, you do, buddy. It's called calling the frickin' army. Put an end to it. Put your foot down like Jackson did. And he sat there and did nothing. Now, many Northerners were actually had mixed emotions. They were angry, they were confused, and they were actually surprised because they had not actually expected the South was going to carry out its threat to secede. But the South, by that point, was very much going to. It was very clear. Now, some lawmakers desperately attempted to lure the Southern states back through proposed peace conventions to try to prevent any conflict. But Nothing was working as the South was adamant that they had had enough of the government, that it was being tyrannical, and they were adamant that Lincoln and the Republicans were going to be their enemy. And the North was adamant because they were angry at the South. They're like, you would dare break up this union right when we're on the verge of becoming a world power, which the United States very much was at that point. The United States, up until 1860, it had growing influence in the Americas. It was starting to grow some influence abroad a little bit. It was on the verge of becoming a world power, and now we got a split in the nation that's going to ruin that. Now, Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky tried one final last attempt of a proposed compromise in which he con which his compromise contained two main ideas. A, what they were in a constitutional amendment to the Constitution that would officially protect slavery where it already existed. Excuse me. And there would also be an extension of slavery to the Pacific and any territory south of the Missouri Compromise Line. Basically, a reinstatement of the Missouri Compromise Line, just ar arguing that any territory that was south of that would have slavery, and there would be a constitutional amendment that basically protected it once and for all where it already was. Neither North or the South took that offer up really seriously. The North was, by that point, opposed to the extension of slavery any, anywhere, and the South was just tired of dialogue because they knew this wasn't going to go anywhere. So now we come to the point the Southern states have seceded away. Where does this idea for a southern nation come together? And the southern nation really comes apart when the, there's the southern unity that many of the southern states feel that was partly created by figures such as John C. Calhoun about 20 years earlier, in which the southern states feel a very big connection with each other. They have similar economies. They have similar ways of life. They share people. They don't really 
think, and they notice that they're different from the North. They're like, why would we want to be individual states when we can unite together as one new nation and form our own government that will serve our interests? Now, Northerners were not entirely against the Southern states forming their own Southern nation or Southern Republic, as it was proposed that they might do. And many of the North, some Northerners and abolitionists believe that it would actually be better if they left and did form their own country because that they believe that the South had just been stubborn and always adamant to protect slavery and that with the South's absence in the United States, they could just make abolishing slavery in the country much easier because the South wasn't going to be there to stop them. However, others in the North, especially of the federal government, they wanted to preserve the Union, even by force if needed. Lincoln himself, he was not exactly, and that's another lie. Lincoln did not outright just want to go to force. Lincoln wanted peaceful resolution to the conflict early on, but it became rapidly clear that it might evolve into a military skirmish. What? I do apologize. We have a dog. No, no, stay. Hold on here. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and let actually let him go out here because he's honestly just whining the heck.